sex in Asia means rape. The Korean government doesn't want you to talk about suicide. China expands more, and the nation responsible for regional safety just might be Indonesia. Plus, we talk about traveling long term and how to work your way through it, and my thoughts on Japan and the YouTube gathering there this past weekend. All this and more, the Chi Ranger podcast starts now. Ah, greetings and salutations, my excellent friends. I hope you're having a fantastic day. My name is Steve Miller, your host, the Internet's Chi Ranger, and I would like to welcome you to the Chi Ranger podcast here on ChiRanger.com, my YouTube channel, or if you're downloading it through iTunes or your favorite RSS audio reader. Now, I have been away for a few weeks doing some catch-up work as we start the new academic year here in Korea. And I gotta say, this semester is shaping up to be fairly interesting. My classes are filled with some amazing students, but because I'm also trying to gear up and do more running, I've actually found that I have had less time to work on certain projects than I originally thought I would have. So most of this year, I've actually taken some extra time out of my day to post a lot of new stories, both on RSS feeds, uh, Twitter, Facebook, Google+, uh, write a lot of interesting news articles and put them up on ChiRanger.com. But now as I'm running more, I'm actually finding that I have less time to do that. And I'm, I'm wanting to actually do more like newsy type videos and have more discussions. So I've made the decision that if breaking, I mean truly breaking news happens, then I will, of course, make a video or write a blog post and put it up on ChiRanger.com because it's something that is very important and needs to go out right then and there. But for a lot of the stories that I talk about, I think they're better suited for the podcast, the first section of the podcast for the news, because it allows us to have a better conversation and in the long run will produce a more interesting and better show for you, which is why I do this. I, I like having the information there, but I also like talking about the subject matters that I choose for the weekly podcast. And I want it to be the cream of the crop. And I think that's what we're going to do. I'm also going to start sharing a little bit more of what happens every day. So originally the, the fall season was just going to be Sunday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Friday with the main shows. But while I was in Japan, I got a lot of feedback, a lot of questions from my user base there, or my, my, my viewers there, my subscribers, that they wanted to see some more things. And it really got me thinking about easier ways to share. So I'm also changing the focus of each channel uh, slightly and just a little bit. Uh, the main channel, the Chi Ranger channel, will, of course, be for all the, the main edited shows, but also... Uh, one of the new programs that I'm working on called the Walk and Talk, where I simply go out and explore something and have the GoPro with me and show you exactly what I see and share my thoughts as they come through my consciousness. It'll be largely an unedited show and longer format. I think I've I want to say I have put together at least two so far. One when I was going to Arirang for the weekly radio show, and then one from Japan. And those are about 18, 20 minutes long. So it really gives you an opportunity to walk in, say, my footsteps, where I am seeing what I see. And I think it'd be a great, great way for more people to learn about Korea, learn about Japan, learn about wherever else I'm traveling, because Joe and I currently are putting the final touches on our January trip, and I, I can't wait, I really can't wait to show you what's coming up in 2000, uh, 2014, I guess 2000, gosh, yeah, 2014, amazing. On the vlog channel, I'm really going to go back to those are going to be main, mainly talking head videos uh, shot here with the uh, computer here in this room, and I'm going to kind of focus on video responses and answering questions back and forth. So that is going to be the focus of the channels and the site this year. 
I think that it is going to be a good change, a positive change, and really geared to showing some of the things that I'm very passionate about, especially when it comes to video content creation. If there is something that just needs to be written, then of course I'll put that up on SheRanger.com. So be sure that you do visit SheRanger.com or have it in your RSS feed. That way, no matter where I upload content, you will not miss it. So that's enough for me rambling on in this introduction. Let's go ahead and get started with the news. Welcome back to the podcast. As we do every week when we start the news, we focus on stories out of North and South Korea. And the first one was one that was shared a little bit ago that really didn't get a lot of press, but I actually thought was probably one of the most interesting stories to come out of late. Now, if you recall, there's been a lot of lawsuits here in Korea against Japanese companies, one in Busan, one in Seoul. I mentioned that several of the comfort women are now suing the Japanese government again. And you can have lots of conversations of whether or not the 1965 bilateral agreement disallows those lawsuits and what the decisions of the Korean courts have with regards to that bilateral agreement. But this story was very interesting. The, Jap the Japan Postal Bank appears to have the accounts containing unpaid wages of Korean workers from World War II. Now, to prevent Koreans from leaving, the companies deposited their wages into the accounts, but prevented them from withdrawing them. The workers were never notified of the accounts, and this has some widespread implications to the ongoing lawsuits and how it can play out with the 1965 bilateral agreement. Now, Japan Postal Bank says they haven't been able to adequately identify who the accounts actually belong to, and they're currently looking into that. Uh, Korea has come out and said, without any doubt, the Koreans who those accounts belong to need to get the money. But this is what I find very interesting. See, the 1965 bilateral agreement clearly states that Japan paid damages to Korea once and for all. And that's the end of any kind of uh, payment that needs to be offered. Now, in this particular instance, you have actually the property of Koreans being held by the Japan Postal Bank that was paid by the companies that they were never notified about. So in one instance, I would assume I would assume that that is, would be considered the property of the Koreans and they're, you know, they are due to get it back or their descendants are due to get it back through inheritance. But will the companies that paid into those accounts say, oh, we've already paid you adequate compensation because of the bilateral agreement. We're going to take those funds back. Now, I hope they don't do that because it would be a huge, huge PR blunder on the part of those companies. But there could be an interesting way to say that legally they have paid. They paid in 1965. So they don't need to pay this other money that's been gaining interest in the Japan Bank, uh, Japan Postal Bank. So that I thought was very interesting. I'd love to hear your thoughts on it. And if you certainly hear any updates in Japan, please let me know. I would love to see if that's being covered in, in any Japanese press. Now, the second story is also very interesting, especially for someone like me who is a content creator. Now, in Korea, we have a program called Be a Good Downloader. Now, this is to avoid piracy or copyright infringement. And the premise is that you just don't illegally download things. But in most of the advertising for this program, it's always about not downloading Korean content. If I go down the street in Gangnam or some other places, I can see pirated DVDs all over the place of foreign films, but not a lot of Korean films or television shows. And this is where it gets interesting. Uh, once more, the cops have swooped in and arrested someone for downloading and distributing pirated content. However, these aren't blockbuster movies. No, these are Korean titles that they were forcibly enforcing. A Gyeonggi University professor had downloaded and distributed several popular Korean shows and was making a huge profit. Basically, he was making big, big, big bucks. I think on the order of three, 
uh, $3 million, I believe. And he got nabbed. But I really think that if he was doing this with American films, they wouldn't have focused so much on him. And uh, again, I, I see this all, all the time around. Everywhere you go, you see pirated blockbuster information. So blockbuster information I sound like a little blue kiosk with a ticket. If you remember from the early United States of video store rentals, you'll, you'll see those. But no, seriously, you, you go out and you really have widespread piracy of big time Hollywood movies and software as, as well. It's very common to find cracked versions or pirated versions of several softwares just out in the open and no one does anything about it. But the moment that you infringe on a Korean content, you are snapped up and made to pay the price. Dennis Robin has announced that he is returning to North Korea and is planning on coaching their North Korean basketball team. Now, my uh, thoughts, my, 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 my uh, thoughts, my thoughts on this is, well, even has-beens need a job. I really don't care too much about it. Uh, if he wants to do it, that's his own recourse. I have said time and time again, I have no intention of going to North Korea to look at things from a tourist perspective because I don't want to give the regime any money. Dennis Robin has come out several times that he doesn't really focus on the political issues inside the country. He's just happy to go see his friend. And I also think that is a fairly naive and uninformed way to look at it. I would not want to make a friend of a dictator who brutally, brutally abuses his own people. That's think, I think that speaks a lot to Dennis Rodman's character as well. Korea is not the happiest place on earth, but it's not the unhappiest either. In a new UN study on happiness, South Korea ranked 41 out of 156 countries on the happiness index. Denmark was number one, Togo was number 156, Japan came in just a few slots under Korea. And I actually found this quite surprising because so many people that I meet here in Korea just talk about how unfulfilled their lives are, how they just really aren't overwhelmed with happiness or overbrewing brewing with happiness. And I guess that I guess that really falls into the result itself. 41 you know, in the top third, I would say. So that would lend itself to some sort of satisfaction, but not really happy. And I really hope that things change. As we finish out the Chuseok weekend, a lot of people are opting nowadays not to go visit family because this is one of the few times where you can actually take off several days in a row without having to burn any vacation time. So this, this year for Chuseok, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday were public holidays. You bump that into Saturday and Sunday. That's five days off. So a lot of people were using this opportunity to go overseas for travel. And I think that is really a good idea. Many people can only get away for a day or two, and this is a nice opportunity for them to actually relax, go to the Philippines, go to Japan, uh, go to some other countries that are relatively close that you don't burn a whole day traveling. In some other news, the Korean government is trying to muzzle the media when it comes to suicides. So. The government has published new suicide guidelines on how the press should cover them in their reporting stories. And they're asking the press to show consideration for surviving family members and friends of victims and to avoid using reports of suicide as a way to draw attention to social issues. And I think that is the big key for me because Korea is the number one nation, both for adolescents and for adults, for suicide. And not being able to address the social issues that cause someone to commit suicide, I think is quite frankly, irresponsible of the government asking the media not to do this. They ask for stories to include information about suicide prevention and exercise extra caution when posting these reports. And now I don't think that's going too far either that if you are know of someone who has a suicidal tendencies, suicidal thoughts, uh, providing some information on where they can get help. The problem is here in Korea, 
counseling has such a negative stigma that many people do not seek that help. So even though the help may be available, there's such a stigma against going forward and asking for that help. They just go on, go on without having to use it. They don't go forward and make use of it, which is a shame because then they feel their only use, their only recourse is suicide. Due to, they also said this, due to the Werther effect, where people are swayed by reports of celebrities committing suicide, some studies suggest that suicide of a one famous person can cause 606 copycats on average. And they're basically asking the media to be extra, extra careful when reporting celebrity suicides, which do happen here in Korea quite often. So again, a lot of it is, I guess, not too bad. But in my opinion, when, when you ask someone to be fairly filtered when reporting a suicide, someone jumping off the bridge, which is the most common thing to do these days, and then say, hey, you need to post this extra information. I, I think you're putting too much pressure on the media to do the work that the government and social services should do in lieu. Uh, well, instead of what they're actually doing now. And I think once and for all, once Korea lifts the stigma of going to see a counselor, you'll see a huge change. North Korea has, of course, restarted one of its reactors. Uh, this is the Yongbyong facility, and it signals that North Korea may have resumed its pl plutonium enrichment. Now, this is, of course, something that we expected for a long time. They said they were going to do this. We're seeing the smokes now. Uh, we could possibly see another test uh, in the next year, which again, they've signaled time and time again that they have no intention of backing away from their nuclear program. So while it was in the news, I think people need to take it for what it's worth. Uh, North Korea said it was going to do it. They advertised this several months ago. They have said they aren't going to back down. They're just carrying through business as usual. Thankfully, the media hasn't gone up in arms about this new development here. And they're basically looking towards China to try to reel in North Korea. However, that doesn't really seem to be that effective now because China did ask Kim to back off, to slow things down, not to really push the envelope push for the development of plutonium, and Kim has ignored that. So any influence that China may have over North Korea may actually be slipping away these days. And finally, finally, from the Korea's Kaesong Industrial Complex has reopened, although it's not as robust as it once was. Now, it's of course shut down earlier this year with the huge conflict between North and South Korea, the joint Game, uh, joint games, the joint weapons drills by the United States, and of course the nuclear test. So they shuttered that five months ago, and they finally have come to some little bit more reliable than tentative agreement to reopen the complex. But here are some stats. Uh, previously, there are 53,000 North Koreans employed in the Kaesong Industrial Complex. When it reopened, only about a thousand arrive for work. The South Korean workforces have remained largely unchanged, and South Korea has actually boosted the power delivered to the facility five-fold. So, again, the main sticking point with the facility is that there's really no good guarantee that North Korea won't come in again and just shut it all down. So, while they have said they aren't going to do that and they're developing some kind of workers' con uh, council to govern and control access and control things. The bottom line is that it's still in North Korea and they have total control. They're trying to get international businesses to buy into the concept and to go to work there, but everyone is turning them down. No one sees this as a good business investment. And I really wish the South Korean government would wise up to the fact that hanging on to the Kaesong Hope is just not worth it.
All right, that's it from the Koreas. Moving on to East Asian news. China is continuing to expand its territory. China is currently involved with four Southeast Asian nations over territorial disputes in the South China Sea. The Philippines had laid claim to one shoal, but when Chinese ships moved in and forced out local fishermen, China assumed control of the region. The Philippines and other nations have been pressing to work together with China to develop a code of conduct for the region and settle the disputes. But China has been problematic, wanting to discuss the issues individually rather than collectively, because they want to pick apart any kind of coalition with the other regional powers and address matters individually. They feel that doing so would give them the upper hand in the negotiations rather than going forward with a collective meeting. In one late development, China is, has been accused by the Philippines that they're actually building on the disputed shoal. Now, China flat out refuses to acknowledge any kind of billing. They say that the allegations are false. The Philippines has, have come back with imagery of 72 cement blocks on the shoal saying that this is a, a prelude to some kind of base or platform or landing platform on the shoal to strengthen China, China's hold on the shoal. So it's gonna be really interesting to see how this ultimately plays out. The South China Sea, with all of its territorial conflicts, not only between the Southeast Asian countries, but also Japan and Korea, it is just a hotbed. I'm more concerned about the tension in this particular region of the world than in the Middle East, because in the Middle East you have, you have a lot of un uncertain, I guess, ways things could go. You have a lot of different avenues that things go sideways. But if things go sideways here in the South China Sea with China, with Japan, with South Korea, those are three huge major players with very powerful military arms. And you have treaties with the United States that they would have to participate in any kind of conflict. It's just a recipe for disaster. Whatever these disputes are, they need to be taken care of in a responsible manner. It's, it's what needs to happen. Also, going back to this story, Indonesia may have the strongest military in Southeast Asia. Now, as a result of China's expansion of power, Indonesia is continuing to build up its military and will have the strongest Southeast Asian military force by 2014. Now, this is not only due to its modernizing the forces, but also from getting equipment from Japan and the United States. And given the proximity to China, this is not necessarily a bad idea to have a forward uh, military force to act as a deterrent and help reel things in without having the United States or Japan bear the brunt of it. So well, it'll be interesting to see how this goes forward. And if the development of the Philippines, which is receiving ships also from the United States and Japan, and the United States is going into the Philippines and, and seeking greater military base access, if that combined front, both archipelagos, Philippines and Indonesia, if that will help calm things down just a little bit. A new UN study shows that 25% of Asian Pacific men rape and largely get away with it. Now, this is a new study of 10,000 men across six countries, and they show that a quarter have, a com have admitted to raping someone and haven't faced any criminal charges. The study was carried out in Bangladesh, Cambodia, China, Indonesia, Papua New Guinea, and Sri Lanka. The surveys uh, conducted of were conducted in nine locations in these countries and found that 10 to 62 percent of men report having raped a girl or woman in their lifetime. And the men said they feel that they were entitled to sex regardless of consent. And I find that deplorable. I find it disgusting. But also, given the high volume of human trafficking and the sex trade in many of these Southeast Asian countries, I also understand how they could be conditioned to feel this way. And it also points to a larger issue in society where people need to stick up for those that are not empowered, that they have rights, and that human trafficking really needs to get 
under control so that men who are conditioned to feel as those in the survey did, that they do not actually have that right. That when someone says no, the discussion stops there. There is no reason ever why rape would ever be appropriate. Japan is actually taking a play out of Korea's playbook with regards to China. With further incursions by China over the disputed islands, Senkaku, Dayu, some flying some drones and putting more surveillance vessels in the area in the East China Sea, Japan has announced it will step up its efforts to secure what it calls its own territory. This could involve placing people on the remote islands that Japan claims, which is the same way that Korea is protecting its easternmost islands, Dokdo. There is actual, an actual uh, base of Coast Guard right there on the islands. The New York Times says an effort by either country to forcibly control the islands could lead to an escalation of the conflict analysts have warned. They also worry that a small, unintended episode at sea with Japanese and Chinese boats, where they chase each other constantly, could lead to a wider conflict. The open hostility between China and Japan, which is an important American ally, uh, also risks bringing in the United States. And again, this is why I am so concerned about these regional disputes is because it has the potential to really just escalate out of control and then you bring in the United States because of treaty obligations, it could just get really, really messy. And if you really want to focus on what needs to happen in the region, follow these disputes because that is where things can get messy. I'm more, again, I'm more concerned about these disputes than North Korea. That's how big of an issue it could actually turn out to be. Also from Japan, they have requested that 28 sites be listed for UNESCO status, including locations where Koreans were forced to work during World War II. Now, the news wasn't well received in Korea, as would be expected, and they have said that Japan is continuing to minimize its responsibility to own up to the facts of World War II and essentially ignore whitewash history. Officially, Japan is submitting 28 industrial sites because they spurred the Meiji uh, or spurred Meiji Japan's spectacular industrial revolution and development from 1868 to 1912. And some of the sites, not all the sites, some of the sites did use conscripted Korean labor, but the overall contribution to Japan's industrialization and development really cannot be ignored. That is, these plants are the reason why Japan was able to rise up to be its huge power that it is today. So it'll be interesting to see how the United Nations, uh, the, the UNESCO branch, uh, takes a look at this. Do they take into consideration that some of the sites used conscripted laborers during the process, especially during the later years in 19, during, during World War II? Um, as I said, these particular sites were mainly used between 1868 and 1912, which is just at the beginning of the annexation period of Korea. So, yeah, it, it's going to be interesting to see how this plays out at the UNESCO offices. Uh, in, in my opinion, what may come down with this is that some of the sites would be approved for UNESCO World Heritage Cultural Sites, what have you, whatever the actual designation UNESCO wants to give to them. But perhaps some of the more controversial sites or sites that had conscripted laborers would be left off the list. I know one of them is a foundry near Hiroshima where the atomic bomb was dropped. And that, that's tough because then you have a site that the Americans destroyed, caused huge, huge civilian casualties, but also is a beacon, a big peace park to show why we never want to use these weapons again. So it's a great, great argument. And to see where the uh, the discussion at UNESCO goes with this. Um, I, I, I really think that a lot of these sites could possibly be listed, and I don't have a problem with that. I, I think that 
as the two countries continue to work out, I'm, I'm speaking of Korea and Japan, that you're going to have a number of these issues. And, and this particular one is not one where I would say it is whitewashing history. These are plants and no one's really hiding the fact that there were conscripted workers there. So we'll see what happens with this one. Uh, in some other news of, I think, fairly interesting note, uh, Korea has a new skyscraper. Now it's only, I want to say around 450 meters tall, but from an engineering perspective, it's quite interesting because it's using cameras and LED lights. Now the way this is going to work is you have a big tall building and on one side you have cameras and on the back side you have LED emitters. And what's going to happen is these cameras are going to take an image and then broadcast it through to the other side, giving it an invisibility type view to it. This is similar to the camouflage or active camouflage that we saw with the sky carrier in the Avengers that S.H.I.E.L.D. was using. And actually that we've seen in several movies before. And I'm more interested to see how this plays out in the long run with other types of technology. I just think it's really cool tech and I really can't wait to see it implemented. And finally, something near and dear to my heart as an instructor, Thailand recognizes the importance of English education. Quote, with a higher proficiency in English, Thai students can change the dynamics of the classroom. They will have access to more information before going to class, forcing teachers to be better prepared and turning traditional lecture rooms into seminars where active exchanges can take place. And this is according to the ASEAN Charter. English is the working language of ASEAN. And businesses across the ASEAN countries do their business. In English. And that is spot on. When I travel around, especially Southeast Asia, the efficacy of English is so much more advanced than here in Korea and even what I saw in Japan. And the reason why is I firmly believe that as developing countries, they recognize that the world does business in English. And if they want a piece of that pie, if they want to raise up their economic status and grab hold of the international market, they need to be able to speak English. They want international tourists to come visit their countries. Most of those tourists are going to be able to speak English, at least rudimentary. So if you're able to convey what you need to in English, you'll be able to do business with them and you will get more money. And this is why Thailand, Indonesia, Philippines, and several other countries their young students, their adolescents, their young adults, and even their adults have a higher use and fluency of English than folks I see here in Korea. In Korea, it's a very much industrial and modern country. And they, many students, even though they say, I want to learn English because I want to speak with foreigners, I want to travel, they just haven't had the burning desire, that need, that fundamental need that says, I must do this now. It's different in those countries versus here in some of the more advanced Asian countries. And even my students now, I'm teaching university students, they will come up and say, I need to learn English because I want to travel. And English is the international language. Even though these students have had access to English education throughout their public education careers, they really haven't focused on studying it as much as Thailand, Philippines, Indonesia, etc. So kudos, kudos, kudos for Thailand for even making a bigger push for English education. Well, my friends, that is the news this week. I'll be back in just a second. Welcome back to the podcast, my friends. It's time now for the question of the week, and it's one I actually got quite frequently while I was in Japan and when I was coming back from Japan. So here we go. What do I think of Japan? What do I think of Tokyo? And what do I think of the YouTube gathering? So let's get it this right out the way first. I'm not going to say which one is better and which one is not because I, I don't travel that way. I, I look for experiences. I look for good times. I try to minimize the bad times. I'm not there to rank countries as to which one is the best. So 
I'm, I'm not going to do that. But I will say this, traveling into Tokyo, I had no concerns about radiation. So anyone that is concerned about going to Japan for radiation, don't worry about it. It really is safe. So get that out of the way. Let's talk about the look and feel of Tokyo. So I unfortunately was only there for a short period of time, one weekend. And while I was there, I spent most of my time in central Tokyo. And to be perfectly honest, I really thought of Tokyo as pretty much the same as so. Uh, a lot of the same look and feel of it, but there of course were some differences. I found Tokyo in general to be at a I guess more relaxed pace than Seoul. Seoul is very much a very busy place. Everyone's on the go. I don't, the, the mentality sometimes comes off as, I don't have time to wait, I need to go now. So that means driving on the sidewalk, blowing through red lights, pushing people out of the way. And in Tokyo, you get the feeling that business is important. You get the feeling that there are a lot of things to do but people are more relaxed, more respectful, more subdued. And I really appreciated that. I really enjoyed being in a big city like Tokyo and not feeling crunched or pushed around as much as I did going into Seoul. Uh, I think from an American standpoint, I would say maybe take a look at New York versus Chicago. You have the big eastern city and then you have more of a midwest city. And the attitude change between those two cities is similar to what I experienced in Tokyo. So it was very much relaxed. But just, just walking around, I, I thought it was very similar. I, I kept on being asked, oh, what do you think about this? Or do they have this in, in Seoul? Do they have this? Is it different here? And, and by and large, it was pretty much the same. There weren't that many different things. The same franchises were there. The cost of things, which I'll get to in, a, in just a minute, were pretty much the same. But the very first meal I had in Tokyo was an onigiri, or what we call here in Korea, a samgok kimbap, triangle kimbap, and a cola. And while the individual prices of those two items were slightly different, the overall cost was the same. And as, I'll go ahead and get into money now, as I was going through my whole weekend, I actually found the price of things in Japan and where I was staying in Tokyo, so Shinjuku region, Akihara uh, region. Uh, so Shinjuku, Roppongi, and uh, Akihabara, all of those places, the prices were comparable to Seoul. I, I really didn't feel they were any more expensive than anywhere else. So money was never a, a huge concern for me. Uh, what I personally found difficult was trying to wrap my head around doing the conversions. I actually had to convert things from yen into dollars and then into Korean won for me to register how much things were were. were uh, actually costing me, uh, but I, I found it very affordable. The, the highest expenses that I found were actually uh, with accommodations. I, I felt the accommodations were a little bit more expensive than what I would pay here in Korea for certain places, and I, I, I didn't like that as much. But food was fantastic. Food, I pretty much had the same food as I had everywhere here. I, I did have coffee at a Starbucks. I found that to be cheaper than in Korea, uh, but I found McDonald's to be slightly more expensive than Korea. So that, that's that. Um, I liked the subway system and I felt that was really a really cool experience. I didn't appreciate some of the subway stations though. And the reason for that, well, let's go back and talk about transportation. So the, the Seoul Metro area, fantastic. Didn't ride any buses, but the Seoul Metro, uh, Seoul Metro, Tokyo Metro, oh, yeah, that's, that, that's actually a, a franchise, a, a, a rail line. The Tokyo subway system, there we go. The Tokyo subway system, is incredible. Lots of different lines interacting. You have the opportunity to travel anywhere you want to. I, f I felt the trains sometimes wrote, uh, ran more frequently 
at the stops. And it really wasn't too much expensive, uh, too much more expensive, anywhere between maybe a dollar or two dollars more than in Seoul. Uh, Seoul just has ridiculously cheap fares. Uh, I did have to take a taxi a few times and the flag drop on that was 710 yen, so seven, $7.10, which I think is a bit expensive compared to Korea. But then again, the rates here in Korea are so cheap that that's why the taxi drivers are trying to get listed as public forms of transportation so they get more government money and they're actually in the process of raising their rates here as well. Uh, but this is what I wanted to say. Uh, two things with the subway st stations. Uh, number one, in Korea, they have signs for you to walk on the left or the right and quite frankly, not a lot of people follow those. In Japan, they also have signs for right and left and whatever the sign says, that's what people follow. They, if it says walk on the left, you walk on the left. If it says walk on the right, you walk on the right. However, what was very confusing for me is I would go to certain different subway stations and they would change. So one subway station, walk on the right. The next subway station, walk on the left. And I found that very confusing simply because I wanted things to be orderly and boom, this is where I need to go. The other thing I didn't appreciate with some of the subway stations is that they didn't have a lot of information in English. And this really surprised me as a fairly big international city that is trying to really recover from a tourism deficit after the radiation problems. So what would happen is at some stations, you would have the station name that you arrive at in Japanese, in English, you'd have extra information, you know, anything you need to navigate in and around the station in English and in Japanese. That's not the problem. But when going to purchase fare tickets, that's where I sometimes ran into a problem. Now on the Toei line, it was brilliant. The maps were in English, they were in Japanese, the machines that you use to buy the tickets, they were bilingual and it was really easy to get whatever you needed. However, I was at, I believe, a Tokyo metro station and it was really difficult because on, on the big map, it could be a JRE station too, I can't remember, but on the big map, you had the subway with all the fares, but none of the stations were in English. So I had a hard problem being able to identify not only where I was, but also where I needed to go so I could calculate how much the fare was. The, the information just wasn't on the map. So going to the computer terminal to pay my fare, I also had a problem because when I selected English, well, no, and that, at this particular stop, there was no English option for me. And I don't know if that's because I couldn't find it or if that particular machine didn't have it, but everything was in Japanese. And I had to ask my friend, all right, how, how much fare do I need to pay? Because I could do it in Japanese. I don't know any Japanese, but after buying all the subway fares that I had actually purchased up to that point, I knew what, what hoops I needed to you know, jump through. I knew I needed to push whatever the, the yen amount was, put in the money, collect the ticket, and be on my way. But there was no real way for me to find out how much the fare was. So I was constantly asking friends that could read Japanese or, or had you know, some kind person come up to me and help me how much is the fare to, to X, Y, Z, and put in the money. That's, that I, I didn't like. I thought that was a bit, bit odd. But um, yeah, so I, I really enjoyed Japan. I thought it was a great place to visit. It was someplace I'd be willing to go back again and spend more time. I really didn't think the short weekend trip was enough. I had a great time there, uh, and that's really what I wanted to do. Um, I grew up using YouTube and having a great community in the United States. I'm still friends with so many people I met from back in the day. And I have some great friends in Japan. And this was, for me, the first opportunity really to meet them. When I was at the gathering, I, was, I, I wanna say that I, I met Jim and Tomoko before, so the Mollies. And I had met Hiko Simon before because he came to Seoul for business. But aside from those two people or three people, I hadn't met anybody. 
And that was amazing because they all knew who I was. They all knew the, the videos that I produced. And it was so great to be able to come up and, and talk to someone. Victor, give me a break, man, who go, who he and I go back for maybe five, six, six, seven years back to the infancy of YouTube. We've talked on Skype. I've been on uh, his Google Hangout show. We, we call each other up on the phone when we have questions about Korea, Japan. And this is the first time I met him. And it was just like picking up with two old friends going on there. Um, Anthony, who gave me a great shirt. First time I've ever met him. Warp Gaijin, Ed, Tomor uh, Ed Tomorrow, Ted, uh, who, who else? Uh, jo Josh, J Hill Life. Um, who, who, uh, James, 11 Colors, who, who we've had conversations for years and years. First time I was able to meet him. Kurt, Softy Papa. I, we, we, Jim and Kurt and I talk on the phone all the time, but it was the first time I ever got to meet him in person. And it was just so nice to be able to hang out and relax. Uh, Warp Gaijin, who we, we talk on Facebook and Twitter all the time. So nice to actually sit down and hang out with you, not only at the YouTube gathering, but we got together the next day and hung out more after that. And that is, it was just awesome. And that's one of the reasons why I am kind of reinvigorated, reinvigorated to do a lot of work, because uh, work on YouTube, uh, because it was that sense of community that has been absent for so long, uh, at least in my little network here in Korea. Uh, that's the kind of thing that I like. And what was really cool is that even though there have been a few videos cropping up on YouTube about the gathering, it really had that look and feel to the classic gatherings back in the United States where we were so happy to sit back, relax, and just hang out that no one brought out a camera. It was awesome and I had such a great time there. I, if, if the opportunity presents itself again for me to go to another YouTube gathering in Japan, I'm, I'm in on it. Uh, thanks again to the folks over at Google YouTube, the YouTube creator space in Tokyo. Phenomenal space. And I may, uh, I may actually do a little uh, video about that, my thoughts on that, because I think it's a cool space. But uh, yeah, I'm going to end things there, if you have a question that you would like to ask me, please send it to questions at chiranger.com. You can email it to me and I'll either put it in the podcast or make a personalized video response for you. <music>Traveling, as you know, is a blast, but paying for it can sometimes stretch your wallet pretty thin. This week on G-Ranger RTW Travel Talk Around the World, we're going to find out a unique way to help pay for your trip. Welcome back to the podcast. This week I have a very special guest. It's Jessica Doughty from waysofwanderers.com. Jessica, welcome to the podcast. I'm excited to be on. Thanks for having me. So, before we get into this week's topic, tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do over at waysofwanderers.com. Sure. Um, well, my boyfriend Brent and I have been traveling for about two years. Um, actually, yesterday was the two-year anniversary of us leaving Canada. Oh, um, congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> um, so, we spent about eight months traveling through Europe doing work away and help exchanges, which I'm going to talk more about with you. And then we've also taught English in Thailand and Japan. Oh. So I write a lot about um, like working and living abroad and also just um, traveling on a budget and traveling long term. Okay, so eight months in Europe, that's, a, that's actually a dream for a lot of people. And did you go there right away from Canada? Was that your first destination or did you hit some place else first? Yeah, no, we, we started out in France. Um, and so that's when we were doing um, the work away and help exchanges. So that's sort of how we funded our whole um, eight months in Europe. Okay, well, let's, let's dive into it. So yeah. <laughs> um, I, 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 will, I will be honest with you, uh, being someone who's a little bit older, 
I usually don't qualify for work type visas, so mm -hmm. I don't really pay much attention to that. But this is something that was very interesting in terms of a topic for me because I do know a lot of people like to travel. They like to travel long term and being able to pick up a job and work while you're traveling is a great way to help fund that. So tell us a little bit about how you actually, you know, funded your trip this way. Um, well, so when we were in Europe, we did um, WorkAway and HelpX exchanges, and so they're both basically the same idea. They're work exchange programs, and so it's volunteer work, but you agree to contribute about 25 hours of work per week for your host, and then in exchange, they give you meals and they give you somewhere to live, typically their house. Um, so actually, it's, it's a great program for people of any age, like, I mean, there were people, like, 18-year-olds backpacking, there was people taking career breaks, there were retired people doing it, like, it's a pretty cool way to travel at any age. Oh, that's cool. That, that, yeah. I, that, that I wasn't, like I said, I wasn't aware of that, because a lot of times I always look at, you know, I like to move around a lot, so I try yeah. to go for someplace for two, three months, maybe, and because of the work visa age limits, I don't usually qualify, so that's, that's <laughs> nice that I would be able to qualify for that kind of work exchange. So yeah. you're, you're, you're in France, you were in Europe. What kinds of work did you do? Um, it, it, it varied hugely, which is actually why, because um, WorkAway and HelpX are very similar to Woofing, which Yeah, you right, that, 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 I, that I'm familiar with. I actually had a friend who left Korea and did a, a project in Hawaii and worked, I think, on a cocoa plantation, cool. which was pretty cool. So, yeah. so, but but tell us about your experience. Um, so there's the whole range. So there's um, kind of farming experiences like um, woofing. Uh, for us, we um, we worked at a couple bed and breakfasts, which was really cool. We um, also helped some people that were doing um, like sort of vacation rentals. Um, and then there was also just sort of people that had really large rural properties that needed help with like maintenance and gardening. And so that was kind of the main stuff that we did. Um, yes. <laughs> okay. So, so, but yeah. okay. So you say like 25 hours a week, 20, 25 yeah. hours a week. Mm -hmm. Is it like five hours a day, five hours a week? You know, I mean, you said you're very, you know, your experience is varied, but tell, tell us, give us some details. <laughs> give us the deets of what you had to do. Okay. Um, well, I mean, it says 25 hours a week. That was actually one of the sort of cons of our experience because we okay. had a very mixed experience with the programs because um, we found that there was like very rarely a very clear starting time and finishing time. Um, so we were thinking it would be kind of five hours a day, five days a week, but often it ended up being like six, seven, eight hours a day. And then we would typically still have two days off a week, sort of like a nine to five job so that we could go traveling around. But so not yeah. not really the twenty five hours, more like forty hours. Yeah, exactly. Um, especially because we were working with a lot of uh, families who were just the kind of people that would you know get up and start working at seven a.m. and work all day until sunset. And mm -hmm. so because we were living with them and volunteering for them, it was sort of uncomfortable for us to work for five hours and say, okay, we're done, and then go relax while they're still working. So we often ended up working for quite a bit longer <laughs> than we were intending to. Now, okay, so so given given the I guess difference that between the expectation and what actually happened, mm -hmm. when when you sign up for these programs and you, it's spelled out in the contract or the agreement that you're going to work 20 25 hours and the hosts expect more of that. Did they ever say? Did they ever say you have to work, or they did this kind of guilt trip you into wanting to work more? It, it was mostly a guilt trip, um, I think, because uh, you know we sort of had this feeling that they were providing so much for us, like giving us free accommodation, giving us meals with the family, and we sort of just felt this sense that if we stopped working and they were still working, we would sort of offer to do a little bit more and kind of hope that they would say, like, no, you've done your five hours, you can stop. But usually they would end up saying, yeah, sure, you can come and help oh, with yeah. this, but keep going. But yeah, so I think, um, I mean, I think part of that was our fault as well, because I think um, it works a lot better if you sort of set clear boundaries and work that out with your host in advance, mm -hmm. because we were sort of afraid to speak up, I guess, and, and say that we felt like we were working too much in a lot of cases, but um, I think, like, if you kind of 
hammer out with your host in the emails before you go exactly how long you're going to be working and what the projects are going to be. I think it can be a lot smoother than some of our experiences were. Okay. Uh, yeah. So, so talk, looking back over your experiences, what mm -hmm. would you say would be some of the highlights of the experience? Um, well, I think that um, there's kind of a trend lately towards experiencing places like a local and more slow traveling, and WorkAway and HelpX really give you that because, like, you know, we did all of the big Europe sightseeing stuff, but we also helped at a charity luncheon and shopped for groceries and cooked dinner, and it was sort of experiences that we would never have if mm -hmm. we hadn't been living with local families. And so I felt like we got to really experience, like, not just traveling in Europe, but really living in Europe. Um, it's also really good for language learning as well, because obviously, like, you're sometimes living in quite small towns where people only speak the local language and your family speaks the local language. And so I think it's a really good opportunity from that perspective. Well, that brings, yeah. uh, that brings up a really interesting point. So you, you said you started in France. So where, where did you travel in Europe? for the eight months with this program, or these programs? Um, so we started in France, and then we had an exchange in Spain, one in Wales, Italy, and then we finished in Germany. Um, and we, we, we traveled to a couple of other countries in between, but we spent about one or two months in each of those countries doing the exchange. Okay, now so during the entire length of your trip, was most of your travel supported by these these work away programs, these work exchanges? Definitely, yeah. We, we kind of based it around spending most of our time assuming that we wouldn't have to pay for accommodation and not have to pay for meals. So, um, yeah, we, we our money went a really long way because, I mean, we'd go for entire weeks where we just ate meals at home and we didn't really spend any money. So it was well, very budget friendly. <laughs> okay, so that brings up a, a very interesting point. So, you know, how if someone was going to say travel for let's say five six months in Europe, doing this type of work exchange and, and planning like like you did, that most of your accommodations and meals would be on you know covered with the exchange. What would be some something of a ballpark figure of how much they would need to save up in addition to kind of cover other miscellaneous expenses? Well, we saved about maybe ten thousand dollars before we before we set out. Mm -hmm. um, I actually kind of wish we had saved a bit more in retrospect because it sort of because we had planned to do all of these back to back exchanges, it sort of locked us in into staying with those exchanges. And so, if things weren't working out with a certain host, like we didn't really feel like we had the flexibility in our budget to just to just leave and kind of go travel on our own for a bit. So, I think probably saving a little more than we had would be a good idea, so that you kind of have that wiggle room if it's not working you want to go somewhere else and but yeah for us it was about it was about 10,000 and that was just so that we could kind of because we usually we were staying in quite small towns and then we would do day trips out to more of the tourist sites and spend a little bit of more money when we were doing that okay now it sounds like a great experience <laughs> but were there any hiccups or I would say even any negative experiences that that you would like to share just in case people can make, you know, a more informed decision of maybe this isn't the program for them. Sure. Um, I mean, I think the, the biggest mistake that we made was not always being really clear on what the projects were going to be when we got there. Like, we would often have exchanges with hosts and they would sort of say, oh, we've got a few little things, some gardening, a little bit of maintenance, like, you know, we'll show you when we get, when you get there. Um, so, for example, like our, our first experience in France, um, so, I mean, I should say, like, on our WorkAway and HelpX profiles, like, obviously, you sort of specify um, what your skills are, and mm -hmm. we definitely don't really have any major manual skills. <laughs> like, you know, Brent had done a little bit of landscaping. I said I can cook and clean, but, you know, we definitely don't have any, like, carpentry, plumbing, any of that sort of major home maintenance kind of stuff. Um, but when we got to our first WorkAway exchange in France, the couple basically gave us like a list of projects that they expected us to complete while we were staying with them. And it was all things like build a new fence in the yard, repair the roof on the shed, <laughs> build, a terrace on, <laughs> build a terrace on the back patio, and it just all things that we had no idea how to start. Um, so, and then I, I felt like 
once they realized that we really weren't capable of taking on those projects on our own, they were pretty disappointed <laughs> with us. Even, even though it was clearly listed in your profile that yeah. that was way outside your comfort zone. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, it was maybe it's a, a bit of a different perspective because I think they, they seem to think that a lot of those things were common sense. But I think that common sense when you've lived in rural France for 10 years is really different than common sense when you've you're a recent university graduate who's never lived outside the city. Like it's just. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So, so in this situation, how, how did you address this? Um, well, at first we, you know, we were really honest and we asked a lot of questions and tried to sort of get them to help us a bit more with the projects. But um, they sort of would give us little brief explanations, but still under the assumption that we sort of had some basic skills to work with, which we we really didn't. Um, so we sort of just tried to muddle our way through the projects and that definitely had varying degrees of success um, and we also ended up taking a lot longer with the projects than they expected because we we're kind of trying to figure it out as we went along um, and so it, it was pretty disheartening because we were really working quite hard and we were doing the best that we could but I felt like they were still pretty disappointed with us. Mm -hmm. well, <laughs> and, and speaking of, of, of the disappointment that you perceived that they they felt did they ever come out and say that hey you really need to do something about the work it's not up to snuff did they ever like really breach the subject with you um it, it was more sort of like just passive aggressive disappointment um at one point we um we tried to build this fence and then we had kind of made it and we went away for the weekend and while we were away it collapsed oh. <laughs> And uh, and when we got back, um, our our host, um, the man, he sort of he just kind of yelled at us, and he said that like you know if you had been here when this happened, we would have kicked you out, and uh, that was that was that was pretty direct. <laughs> but again, it was you know we had sort of done the best that we could, but we really just didn't know what we were doing. <laughs> so, true, true, true. Yeah. Now, now, given these experiences, would doing the work exchanges be something you'd be interested in doing again if you're going to travel through Europe? Um, I, I think for me, I, I probably wouldn't do it again, but I mean, I think it can work if you sort of, like, because I would do it differently if we were to do it now compared to when we were starting out. Okay, and, well, well, how, how would you do it differently then? Um, well, I would definitely um, be comfortable with setting boundaries and say, like, be comfortable speaking up when I think I've done enough work for the day and also again getting a clear idea of the projects like exactly what they're going to want us to do when we're there because then we can kind of tell if those projects are going to be within our skill level and so I think as long as I think we just didn't have a clear enough picture of, of what we were getting into but I think as long as as you do that it can be because I mean there were certain places we went to where we didn't have to have a lot of experience like for example when we were helping at um the bed and breakfast like mm -hmm. that was just making beds doing laundry and i mean anyone anyone can do that so i think i would focus more on finding exchanges like that that are a little bit more straightforward okay that, that sounds uh, like like you said straight up in your comfort zone, within your skill set, something you can handle. I think that's really, you know, the, the big takeaway is that when you do a program like this, you really need to communicate with your host and figure out what the tasks are and if it's going to really work. Because, you know, they're, they're, they're putting you up, they're, they're feeding you, and, and they, they need to get something out of it as well that is, is fair and equitable. Exactly, yeah. And I think it's good to have a backup plan, too, because, like, if, if something's not working out, I think you should... Like sometimes you just don't click with certain hosts and it's, you know, perfectly okay to walk away from it. But we were sort of so set on going to all of these hosts that we lined up for eight months. And I think it's better if you can kind of be flexible about it. Sure. Any, any other words or, or of advice or, or tips of people who would be looking at doing this that you can give? Mm -hmm. I mean, the people that I met that seemed to be having the most success with it were people who really did have some solid manual skills to contribute, like people who had experience in carpentry or plumbing or just really kind of overall DIY people, I mm -hmm. think, because they were able to really give something solid to their host. If they could come in and put down new flooring for them or something, like obviously that's, I feel like the host really felt like they were getting the most benefit out of volunteers like that. 
So I think it's a particularly good program for people who have those skills to, to offer. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's cool. Well, Jessica, thank you so much for joining us this week on the podcast. Thank you for having me. Super. Now, if you're interested in finding out more about what Jess does over at her blog, you can go to the show notes and click on the link that will take you right to waysofwanderers.com. You can also follow her on Twitter at Ways of Wanderers. All right, I'll be back in just a second. All right, my friends, that will just about do it for this week's podcast. I hope you had a great time. Thank you so much for joining me. I really do appreciate you taking time out of your week to watch the podcast, to download the podcast, to listen to it. It means so much to me. To keep up with everything that I'm doing, please add chiranger.com to your RSS feed. It has just about every article, every video I post goes up there, but you can also subscribe to both the main channel and of course the vlog channel, as well as follow me on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. If you have any thoughts or comments about the podcast, please send those to me. You can email me at podcast at chiranger.com. I love hearing your feedback. It means so much to me because I do this show for you. I want to make it the best experience for you. So please let me know your thoughts. I can't wait to hear from you. All right. That is it. Thank you again so much for watching. I will see you next week with another episode. Until next time, remember to be true to yourself and always be awesome. The Chi Ranger podcast is written and produced by Steve Miller and licensed under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial No Derives 3.0 Unported License. Morning Blue was written and performed by Josh Woodward.